Well, CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... A little test. Now, right off the top of your head, how many immortal literary phrases come to mind? I'll go along with you. None but the brave deserve the fair. To err is mortal, to forgive divine. O oh, death, where is thy sting? And last but not least, elementary, my dear Watson. Yes, dear mystery theater fans, you have made the correct deduction. We are about to embark on another adventure with the fabulous Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. My dear Holmes, I know you're a stormy petrel and that puzzles follow you like night to day. This is obviously a matter of petty housebreaking, pure and simple. Watson, I quite agree with your diagnosis of housebreaking, but it is neither pure nor simple, and I fear it may yet prove to be simply deadly. Our mystery drama, The Rygate Mystery, was adopted especially for the Mystery Theatre by Murray Bennett and stars Gordon Gould. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Sherlock Holmes fans, and who isn't, are accustomed to following the great detective into every imaginable situation. In and out of handsome cabs, on railroad stations, on the underground, on the Thames, in wild boat chases. But the last place you'd expect to find him is in a hospital room, suffering from nervous exhaustion. Good morning, Watson. Oh, why are you up, Holmes? I gave you a sedative last night that should have had you sleeping till noon. Indeed you did. Oh, what happened? You know my methods, Watson. Reason it out. Yeah. You didn't take it. Excellent, Watson. Oh, you really incorrigible, Holmes. <laughs> I must... First, tell me, are you visiting me as a physician or as a friend? Both. But as your physician, I must insist that you follow my instructions. Now, why didn't you take the sedative? Because I'm feeling perfectly fit. Well, as your friend, I rejoice. As your physician, I disagree. You must admit, Holmes, that even your iron constitution broke down under the strain of unraveling the colossal schemes of the Netherlands Sumatra Company, and you need rest. I trust you're not prescribing a longer stay here in the hospital. Oh, no, not at all. Hmm. I know you. This is no place for you to get the rest you require. How does a week in the country strike you? Where? Surrey. With my old friend from Afghanistan, Colonel Hater. And his household? Oh, a bachelor establishment home. Uh -huh. No one to fuss over you except your friend and physician. <laughs> it will be ideal. Rest is your prescription, and rest I shall have. Just make arrangements to have me discharged from this hospital. And so it was we came to Colonel Hater's house near Rygate in Surrey and walked straight into what at first blush seemed a petty problem. Shortly after dinner, I insisted upon an early bedtime because of Holmes' condition. But our host said... Oh, by the by, I think I'll take a pistol from my collection upstairs with me, in case we have an alarm. An alarm, Colonel Hater? Exactly. We've had a scare in this part lately. Old Acton, who's one of our county magnates, had his house broken into last Monday. Oh, no great damage done. But the thieves are still at large. No clues? No, none as yet. Oh, but after your great international affair, this must seem small potatoes to you, Mr. Holmes. Yeah, I quite agree with you, Hater. I suppose there were no features of interest? I fancy not. <laughs> the thieves ransacked the library and got very little for their pains. 
<laughs> Might even have been vandals. What makes you think that, Colonel? Well, it seems obvious to me. The whole place was turned upside down, drawers broken open, presses ransacked, and uh, the result is uh, an odd volume of Pope's Homer, two-plated candlesticks, an ivory leatherweight, a small oak barometer, and a ball of twine are uh, all that the thieves took. It was an extraordinary assault, man. Yes, that's why I say vandals. The county police ought to be able to make something of that. Why, surely it's obvious uh, that... Oh, 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 my dear fellow... You're here for a rest. Now, for heaven's sake, don't get started on a new problem when your nerves are still shaky. You've made your point, Watson. I shall be a good patient and get along to bed. Hater and I were down early to breakfast, and I was pleased to see that Holmes was sleeping late. When suddenly, the butler rushed in agitatedly. Have you heard the news, Colonel? At the Cunninghams? Oh, burglary? Murder? Oh, my word. Who was killed? Uh, J.P. or his son? Neither, sir. It was William the coachman. Shot through the heart, sir. Who shot him? Well, the burglar, sir. Then ran off and got clean away. Oh, it's a bad business. Hmm. A bad business. Good morning, gentlemen. What's a bad business? Oh, Holmes. Hmm. Good morning. Uh, you may go, Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins just told us about a murder over the Cunninghams. Cunningham? Yes, a leading light in the county. Justice at peace and all that. A decent fellow. He was murdered? No, oh, no, 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 no. Not Cunningham. His coachman caught a burglar in the act and got shot for protecting his master's property. <laughs> Evidently the same villain which broke into actions. And stole that very singular collection. Yeah, precisely. Uh, now, Holmes, you promised. Just breakfast conversation, Watson. Mm, this tea is excellent. Mm, it does appear to me just a trifle curious. A gang of burglars or one burglar operating in the county might be expected to vary the scene of their operations and not crack two cribs in the same district within a few days. Yes, well, not if they were local fellows. Uh, in that case, Actons and Cunninghams are just the places to go, uh, for they're far the largest around here. And richest? Uh, they ought to be. Yeah, but they've had a lawsuit going for some years, which has sucked the blood out of both of them. Acton has some claim on Cunningham's estate, and, oh, the lawyers have been at it with both hands. Really, Holmes, I, I think we should change the conversation before... All right, Watson. If it's a local villain, there shouldn't be too much difficulty in running him down. And I don't intend to meddle. Inspector Forrester, sir. Good morning, Colonel. I hope I don't intrude... But we heard that Mr. Holmes of Baker Street is here. Ah, Inspector. Yes, he, he sits across from me now. Oh, Mr. Holmes, if you don't mind, we could do with a bit of assistance. <laughs> the fates are against you, Watson. We were chatting about the matter when you arrived. Perhaps you can fill me in on some of the details. Gladly. We had no clue in the act in robbery. But here we have plenty to go on. And there's no doubt that it was the same party in each case. The man was seen. Ah, by whom? The Cunninghams, father and son. The elder Mr. Cunningham saw him from the bedroom window, and young Mr. Alec saw him from the back passage. What time was this? Oh, a quarter to twelve. Mr. Cunningham had just gotten into bed, and Mr. Alec was in his dressing gown smoking a pipe. And? Where well, they heard William, the coachman, crying out for help. Mr. Alec ran down to aid William. The back door was open, and as he reached the foot of the stairs, he saw two men struggling. One of them fired a shot. The other dropped, and the killer rushed across the garden and over the hedge. And there was no pursuit. Mr. Alec stopped to see if he could help William. So the killer got clean away. Mm. Any descriptions? Only the glimpse old Mr. Cunningham got from the window. Beyond the fact that he was a middle-sized man and dressed in some dark material, nothing. Mm. And what was William doing there at that time of night? Did he say anything before he died? Uh, not a word. Do you have any theories? Well, the act in robbery has put everyone on guard. William lived at the lodge with his mother, and since he was a very faithful fellow, I imagine he walked up to check the house, and, 
Well, came upon this robber just as he burst through the door. Burst through? Oh, the lock had been forced. Did William say anything to his mother before going out? Well, she's very old and very deaf. I'm afraid the shock has thrown her into complete senility. Oh, pity. If that's all, there are a few small matters I should like to examine. Oh, there's one other thing, Mr. Holmes. This piece of paper was found between the finger and thumb of the dead man. It appears to be a fragment torn from a larger sheet. Mm, may I? Oh, of course, sir. On my word, Inspector, this is extraordinary. There are much deeper waters than I thought. Well, you notice, sir, that the fragment we have read... Uh... At quarter to twelve, learn what may be... And that leads you to surmise, Inspector? Well, that it may have been an appointment. The exact time, a quarter to twelve, suggests that. And then that opens up the possibility that William was some kind of accomplice. That's an ingenious and not entirely impossible supposition. But the writing, Inspector, the writing opens up a whole new area of complications which must be explored. Come, Inspector, there's work to be done. And Watson, you and you, Colonel, will have to excuse us. I must say I was a bit put off by being pushed out of the investigation in so cavalier a fashion by Holmes. But Holmes later gave me the reasons for his decision and also filled me in as to what steps he took. His first request was to visit the morgue with Inspector Forrester where he examined the clothes of the murdered coachman. He certainly died from a revolver wound, Inspector. Well, had you doubted it, Mr. Holmes? Ah, I throw out the test everything, Inspector. There are some very interesting things about his clothes. Remarkably neat, I should say. And their very neatness tells us a good deal. If you're referring to the fact that it supports my theory that he was there because of the appointment, well, I'll agree with you, sir. That, quite possibly. But more than that, Inspector, much more... What's that, then? I suggest you refer to your notes. I have no doubt that you'll come to the same conclusions as I did. Did he have a wallet? Oh, here. Nothing's been touched. Mm, two pounds, an identification card, a receipt for some gloves, and... What's this? A photograph of a girl. Uncommonly handsome, I'd say. Oh, she is indeed, sir. Oh, that's, uh, <clears throat> Anne Harrison. His girl? Well, that's hard to say, Mr. Holmes. And he is, uh, well, what you might call a free spirit. Mm. I think we should visit her. That's not possible. She disappeared a few days ago. Her family's upset. Doesn't know where she is. Have they reported her missing? Oh, no, it's not like that. She left a note saying she was going to London and she'd be gone some time. Does she have friends in London? None that we know. Was she still seeing William before she took off for London? Well, it was kind of an off-again-on-again again thing. A sort of difficult to explain. Inspector, I think our next step is to visit the scene of the crime. Here we are, Inspector. According to your eyewitnesses, the struggle took place about here. Yes, sir. And now... Now you'll struggle with me. Oh, but Mr. Holmes, Mr. Watson said... Touch, you... man. We'll only simulate a struggle. Come on. Oh, come on. Remember, this is a matter of life and death. Enough, enough, enough. That should do it. Oh, what are you doing, sir? Examining the ground here. But we can see the marks where the struggle took place just a few feet away. True, Inspector. But I must base my deductions on facts, and facts must be tested. Come along now. We are finished here. Where to? The King's Arms. Oh, that's a local pub. Oh, I didn't know that. It was the name on the matchbox William Kerwin was carrying. Well, there'll be nothing there but a lot of gossip. Exactly what I'm hoping. A lot of gossip about a free spirit named Anne Harrison. <laughs> Social FM is an expression much used and loved by Gaelic detectives who cling to the belief that at the center of every crime is a woman. 
However, in the 1300 pages that constitute the Holmesian saga, it's a rarity to come upon a case where the catalyst of the crime was a woman. Have we made a discovery? We'll find out in Act Two shortly. The importance of the straight man in comedy has been well established. But how about literature? There would have been no Dr. Johnson without Boswell. And in detective fiction, where would Hercule Poirot have been without his Cherami Hastings? And Sherlock Holmes without Dr. Watson is unthinkable. Therefore, it's surprising to find Holmes pursuing clues in a murder investigation without the good doctor at his side. We found him at the Rygate Village pub without Watson. Barney, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Holmes, this is Barney Stapleford, the owner of the King's Arm. Oh, it's an honor, an honor. I never thought I'd meet the famous Sherlock Holmes in person. Uh, drinks are on the house. Thank you, but it's a little early for me. Mr. Holmes is looking for information about... And Harrison. Oh, well, that might take some time. Hey, you mind if I sit down? By all means. Uh, well, now, Mr. Holmes, what would you like to know? First, did she come here often? Hmm. If we call two or three times a week, often she did. But then again, there's not much doing in her eye gate. Not for a high spirited looker like Addie, that is. Oh, no wonder she's off for London. That's where she belongs, if you ask me. Did she have a particular friend among the local gentry? Well, I don't rightly know so you could call them gentry. Although Mr. Acton and young Alec Cunningham are big landowners. But William Kerwin was fair gone on her. And how did she feel about him? Oh, same way she felt about anything in trousers. <laughs> she loved him. Oh, come on now, Barney. That's no not the eye inspector. You know Annie as well as I do. As I recall, you had a bit of a fling with her yourself. Uh, uh, Barney, uh, that tongue of yours is going to get you into a lot of trouble one of these days. Now, Inspector, nothing wrong with what our host has been saying. All I gather is that Anne Harrison engenders warm feelings in the opposite sex. Uh, she was trouble. And that's how she came to meet the Inspector here. He was called in to break up a brawl between Alex Cunningham and Mr. Acton. And there you go again, Barney. It was simply a loud argument, not a brawl. Over Miss Harrison? Ah, uh, she seemed to have gotten her dates mixed up. And, uh, <laughs> Mr. Holmes, she did seem to enjoy the fracas. When was Miss Harrison last in here? Oh, I just remember exact date. But I do know she was with William. Must have been about a fortnight ago. Then that would have been before the burglary at Mr. Acton's, wouldn't it? That's right, sir. Just about before that time. When Holmes returned with Inspector Forrester, he looked drawn and pale, and I insisted he go up to his room and rest. I took this opportunity to try to find out from the inspector what progress he and Holmes had made with the case. It's no use asking me any more questions, Doctor. Mr. Holmes is behaving very queerly. Makes me simulate a struggle, break through hedges, and I told you about his interest in village gossip. Well, no need to alarm yourself, Inspector. I found that there's usually method in his madness. Well, some folks might say there was madness in his method. It's not the first time we've heard that from the police, eh, Watson? Oh, I'd hoped you'd rested longer, Holmes. You really should Nonsense, dear friend. Your prescription did wonders for me. Inspector, I think we'd do well if we had a talk with Anne Harrison. Every effort should be made to locate her in London. Begging your pardon, Mr. Holmes, but I don't see the young lady as a key in this murder. We know for a fact that she was well away before William Cohen was shot. And well away just before the Acton House was ransacked. Well, coincidence, probably. Had she ever gone to London before? Not to my knowledge. I prefer dealing with facts, not coincidences, Inspector. The facts are the Acton House was robbed. The Cunningham's coachman murdered. Both families are involved in a lawsuit. 
and members of both families have evinced a strong interest in Anne Harrison, who, coincidentally, is also deeply involved with William Kerwin, the murdered coachman. I take it that you attach no great importance to the scrap of paper found in the dead man's hand. You take it wrongly, Inspector. Whoever wrote that note was responsible for bringing William Kerwin out of his bed and perhaps to his death. How did William get the note? Was it delivered by hand, or did it come through the post? Well, I made inquiries. William received a letter by the afternoon post yesterday. The envelope was destroyed. Excellent, Inspector. Now, we agree that this is part of a sheet of paper torn out of the dead man's hand. Why was someone so anxious to get possession of it? Well, because it might incriminate him. Exactly. And what would he do with it once he'd gotten hold of it? Oh, well, I have no idea. Oh, I told you the ground was searched thoroughly in the hope of finding him. No, Inspector. If our deductions are correct so far, our criminal was in a desperate hurry. He is not likely to have stopped to dispose of it. And we can buttress this line of reasoning by noting that he was in such a rush, he overlooked the piece left in William Kerwin's hand. Oh, very true, so very true. But how does that help us decide what he did with it? The most likely thing. He thrust it into his pocket. If we could get the rest of that sheet, we'll have gone a long way towards solving the mystery. Well, I've heard you were a miracle worker, Mr. Holmes. But how do we get to the criminal's pocket before we catch the criminal? Obviously, Inspector. Exactly the same way you make an omelette without breaking eggs. After the inspector had left, not without giving Holmes a very strange look and promising to meet again with Holmes later in the day, I had questions to put to my old friend. Inspector Forrester is quite good, Watson, but he is inclined to rush things without examining the facts very closely. As a matter of fact, Holmes, uh, he was complaining about your methods as being time wasters. And for the life of me, I, I couldn't explain to him why you insisted on making sure that William Kerwin had indeed been shot. I never questioned that for a moment, my dear fellow. Oh, but, but then... Think, Watson, think. What were we told? Uh, that the man was shot. Of course. And? And uh, that the intruder or the killer ran off and escaped. Before that, Watson. Before that. Uh, before mm -hmm. uh, uh, Well, there was a struggle. Excellent. Now, bring to bear your knowledge as a physician. Two men are struggling. One, presumably, has a gun. Suddenly, a shot. A man falls. The other runs away. What, as a physician, would you expect to find on the body of the corpse? Mm, powder burns, of course. Exactly. But, Watson, not only were there no powder burns on the body, neither could I find any on the clothes that William Kerwin had on him when he was shot. Good heavens. Did you tell this to Inspector Forrester? Oh, I tried to point it out to him, but he's off on another scent. You, uh, you promised to tell me about the note. And why you were so positive that Anne Harrison hadn't written the note. No one person wrote that note, Watson. <sighs> what on earth do you mean? No doubt you noted that I made a very careful examination of the corner of the paper which the inspector submitted to us. And it was evident to me that two different people had collaborated on the writing of the note, doing alternate words. Oh, but, but why, Holmes? Why in the world would two people go to such lengths to write a note in that fashion? Obviously, the business was a bad one, and one of the writers distrusted the other and was determined that whatever was done, each should have an equal hand in it. Well, then murder must have been a possibility when the note was written. You never cease to amaze me, Watson. That is indeed a most excellent deduction. <laughs> and certainly, if not murder... A devilish bit of business. Uh, then, of course, we can throw out the possibility that the burglary of Actons and this crime were in any way connected. I find it difficult to believe that two crimes such as this, committed within a fortnight of each other and involving two families who are having a dispute, is merely a coincidence. Particularly when you add the complication of Anne Harrison's involvement with both the families and the murdered man. But Holmes... What is the connection? What could it be? Watson, if we knew that, we'd know everything. But come along. 
We have an appointment with Inspector Forrester at the scene of the crime. Mr. Holmes, I have news from London, and it may be important. Was she badly injured? Oh, she's in the hospital, but the doctors say that she'll recover. She... Oh, hold on. I never said Annie was hurt. How did you... Come, come, Inspector. You have news from London of great importance and interest to me. That news could only concern the young lady, Anne Harrison. Well, that's all very well, but the fact that she was hurt... I know of your personal interest in the lady. And since you're obviously perturbed and flustered, it could only be that she'd suffered some harm. How did it occur? She was shut upon by some thugs, robbed and beaten... But fortunately, they caught the rascals. And they implicated someone from this area? Uh, not precisely, but they did say they were hired. I see. Do you recall the name of the officer in charge of the case? Well, I'm not sure. It was something that sounded like, um, uh, Lester or Lestrade. Inspector Lestrade. I know him. He's a competent man. And we'll have that sort of information from him soon. But I fear we can't wait. I see you placed a constable by the kitchen door. So let us get to work immediately. If you'd be so kind, Inspector, as to go around the front, I'll have the constable open the kitchen door for me to enable me to take some tests. And what will you be wanting of me in the front, Mr. Holmes? Times. When I see Dr. Watson appear, I'll want to know the exact time. I'll be waiting, Mr. Holmes. Come along, Watson. Mm -hmm. Throw the door open, if you please, officer. Now, Watson... I'd like you to go up those stairs about halfway and tell me what you can see. Uh, uh, with or without my glasses, Holmes? No, I'll want you to wear them, please. There, that's far enough, Watson. Now tell me, what do you see? I can see the garden quite clearly. Anything else? Oh, yes, a good part of the hedge that lines the road. Anything in particular strike you? Yes, there's a large bush in the garden near the hedge. Stands out clearly. Excellent, Watson. I'd like you to join me now. Oh, now then, what was that all about, Holmes? It was on those stairs that young Alec Cunningham was standing when he saw the men struggling. Come along outside again. And he saw the fellow get away by crashing through the hedge just to the left of that bush. Now, look up at the house yonder. The second window from the left. That's my father's room. Oh. Then you must be Alec Cunningham. And you must be the famous Sherlock Holmes from London. Thank you. And this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson. Mm -hmm. Well, well, Watson. It seems that our young friend here is acquainted with us. As is the world, Mr. Holmes. I saw you strolling about here and came to tell you that my father's been so upset by the events of the past few days that he has taken to his bed. I'm sorry to hear that. Anything you want to know, I'll be only too happy to tell you. But I'm sure Inspector Forrester has told you everything you need to know. He's been very cooperative, but there are still some questions to be answered. Not by my father. That won't be necessary. It's obvious that your father could very well have seen the two men struggling from his window, just as you observed them from the stairs. Yes, that's right. And then you ran out and knelt beside the wounded man? Correct. I wonder if you could show us the precise spot. The ground is very hard, you see, and there are no marks to guide us. Well, if you wish. Although I don't know what good it will do. I thought you were never at a loss. <laughs> yes, right here. Right here is where I knelt down. Uh, just as the inspector told me. You know, Mr. Holmes, you don't seem to be so very quick as you're supposed to be. Oh, well, all of us need a little time. Ah, well, you'll need it. Bumbling around here, I don't see that we have any clue at all. Oh, no, that's not fair. You don't know that if Holmes could only lay his hands uh, on... Uh, oh, good heavens, uh, Mr. Holmes, what's the matter? Uh, He's been overdoing it. That's what... Here, help me with him. Gently now. On the ground, uh, Dr. Watson. Oh, no. together we can carry him into the house. And there, I'm sure he'll come round. <laughs> What is sometimes overlooked by the devotees of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson is the genuine respect that Holmes had for Watson's ability as a physician. Although Holmes was tolerantly skeptical of Watson's deductive powers, there is no instance in any of the stories where Holmes denigrated Watson's medical skills. 
That's all to the good. Because it appears that Holmes himself is sorely in need of those skills now. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. I don't think anyone can really claim to be a real fan of Sherlock Holmes who isn't also a lover of the English countryside. So many of Holmes' cases take him and Watson to the moors or to various charming spots in Sussex, Wessex, or as in this case, Surrey, that there are actually tours organized for aficionados where they can retrace the steps of their favorite sleuth. Here we are in the village of Rygate in Surrey, in the living room of the Cunningham house. I'm most dreadfully sorry, Cunningham. I'm sure I put you to a good deal of inconvenience. Uh, nonsense, Holmes. I was worried about you there. You looked rather ghastly. Uh, Mr. Holmes has only just recovered from a severe illness. I've probably been overdoing, Watson. Shall I send you home in my carriage? Thank you very much, but since I'm here, there's one point I'd like to clear up. Well, what is it? It seems to me to be a distinct possibility that your coachman, William, arrived not before but after the entrance of the burglar into the house. Well, I can't see why you'd think that. The door was forced. The marks were clear, but you and your father take it for granted that the robber never got in. Well, I'd not yet gone to bed, and I'd certainly have heard anyone moving about. Where were you? In my dressing room. Your dressing room? Is that the window next to your father's? Yes, it is. Then both of your lamps were lit? <laughs> Undoubtedly, we were both up. That's very curious. Very curious indeed. What are you talking about? The fact that a burglar, and a burglar who had some previous experience, should choose to break into a house when he could see from the lights that two of the family were still awake. Your notion that the man robbed the house before William tackled him is absurd. We should have found the place disarranged and also found things missing. It depends on what the things were. You must remember that we are dealing with a very peculiar burglar who appears to work on lines of his own. For example, look at the queer lot he took from Acton's. What was it again? A uh, ball of string, a uh, letter weight, another arsenic. Thank you, Watson. Well, crime isn't my field, and we're quite in your hands, Mr. Holmes. Anything you suggest will be done. Excellent. In the first place, I should like you to offer a reward. Now, whatever you say. I've jotted down the form here, if you'd be kind enough to sign it. I thought... Fifty pounds was quite enough. Oh, my father and I would be willing to give five hundred. Here's the form. Oh, well, this isn't quite correct. I wrote it rather hurriedly. This reads, uh, whereas at about a quarter to one on Tuesday morning, an attempt was made, uh, and so on. Well, it was at a quarter to twelve, as a matter of fact. Oh, my apologies. You're quite correct, of course. I can't think how I happened to... Holmes, this just goes to prove that you're still not yourself. <laughs> well, no matter. I'll make the correction. And, Mr. Holmes, get it printed as soon as possible. You may have mistaken the time, but the idea is an excellent one. There you are. Thank you. And now I think we should go over the house together and make sure that this rather erratic burglar didn't carry anything away with him. Let's start with the door here. Yes. Mm. Marks indicate a chisel or a strong knife was used to force the bolt back in. You don't use bars, then, Cunningham? We've never found it necessary. You do keep a dog, though? Yes, but he's chained to the other side of the house. When do the servants go to bed? Usually about ten. Was that also true of William? Yes. It's singular that he should have been up on this particular night. And so Holmes continued his methodical inspection of the architecture of the house, and not without a good deal of grumbling from young Alec Cunningham, who refused to yield when Holmes wanted to go into his father's room. We were in young Cunningham's dressing room, and he offered to let Holmes examine his bedchamber. Holmes accepted. As we entered the room, a carafe of water and a dish of oranges stood near the foot of the bed. <laughs> to my astonishment, as we passed, Holmes deliberately knocked the whole thing over. Now you've done it, Watson. A pretty mess you've made. But Holmes, I never... Uh, 
Oh, well, I suppose I'll try to clean it up. No, here, I'll give you a hand. Uh, mind the glass pieces. Well, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, Doctor, but in my opinion, your friend Holmes is off his head. Well, his behavior may be due to his recent... Hello. Where is he off to now? Huh? Where is he? Well, I can't have him running around here. Holmes? Holmes, where are you? Help! What's it? Forrester, help! Oh, I... No, you don't. Let go there. Oh, the wood, would you? What's going on here? Arrest these men, Inspector. Mr. Cunning and Willie Sun. They're the ones. Oh, well, on what charge? Murdering their coachman, William Kerwin. Oh, come now, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure you don't really mean... Tuts, man, look at their faces. Well, well I'm sorry, Mr. Cunningham. I trust this will prove to be an absurd mistake. This what? is what we really wanted. The remainder of the note. Precisely. Oh, where did you find it? Well, I was sure it must be. I'll explain everything to you presently. Watson, I'll be back with the inspector at Colonel Hater's in time for lunch. And Holmes was as good as his word. He and Inspector Forrester arrived just as the Colonel and I were sitting down. Ah, Mr. Holmes, uh, Dr. Watson has given me the news. I still can't bring myself to believe it. The Cunninghams? Are you sure you're not barking up the wrong tree? Oh, I'm afraid he's not, Colonel. Your thoughts were the same as mine. But there's no question Mr. Holmes has gotten the right end of this stick. Although how he came to see it is beyond me. Inspector... Your handicap was in knowing these important people. You recall that we both agreed immediately upon the importance of the scrap of paper in the dead man's hands. Certainly, but that in itself... Excuse me, Inspector. Alec Cunningham said that the assailant, after shooting Kerwin, fled instantly. Did he not? Yes. Then it couldn't have been the assailant who'd torn the paper from the dead man's hand. And since young Cunningham said he'd knelt by the dead man, and then his father and servants had come upon the scene, Therefore, the only one who could have snatched the paper had to be Mr. Alec Cunningham. Ah, it's crystal clear, Mr. Holmes. Well, now it is, Colonel. Oh, but at the time... We had another clue. Remember, Inspector? I called your attention to the condition of William Kerwin's clothes. Because, according to Alec Cunningham's statement, he was shot at close range. But there were no powder burns upon the clothing. It was then that I found myself looking askance at the part which had been played by Mr. Alec Cunningham. But the motive, Holmes. Why would the Cunninghams want to murder their coachman? Exactly, Watson. The question cries out for an answer. I felt all along that the answer would be found in the note that was torn from the dead man's hand. But the question remained, where was that note? Well, my question is, what the devil was a coachman doing in the garden at that time of night if he didn't see a burglar? If you throw out the burglar theory, and I'd already discounted that for reasons which I'll explain shortly, there remains only one answer. He was there to meet someone. But Holmes, uh, I, I thought you were convinced this whole thing started with the burglary at the Acton House. And so it did, with the thieves taking a collection of useless objects which leads to the inescapable conclusion that the robbers didn't find what they were looking for and just took the first things that came to hand to make it appear to be a robbery. Why, I fail to see the connection. And now is the time to refer to the corner of paper the inspector submitted to me. As I told you, Watson, it seemed to be part of a most remarkable document. Well, you said it was written by two people writing alternate words. Wasn't that drawing a rather long bow, Mr. Holmes? Not at all, Inspector. Let me draw your attention to the strong T's of at and to, and ask you to compare them with the weak ones of quarter and twelve, and you'll instantly recognize the facts. Well, now that you point it out, it seems very clear. But there's much more. You may not be aware that the deduction of a man's age from his writing is one which has been brought to considerable accuracy by handwriting experts. It was simple to deduce that the writers of this note were a young man and a much older one. And there's a further and much subtler point. The handwriting belongs to men who are blood relatives. Oh, come, Mr. Holmes, this almost smacks of witchcraft. So that put you squarely on the trail of the Cunninghams. And the note. I was almost certain that young Alec had torn it out of the dead man's hand 
and thrust it into the pocket of his dressing gown. Why the dressing gown, Holmes? Time, Watson. Time. Where else could he put it? Well, at that moment I'll agree. But why would he not have destroyed it later? He would have if he had known of its importance. And you, Watson, were about to inform him of that fact when, by the luckiest chance in the world, I tumbled down in a sort of pit and so changed the conversation. Holmes, do you mean to say that that feint of yours was an imposture? Then when I recovered, I managed to get young Alec to write the word 12 so that I might compare it with the 12 in the paper. I swear I'll never waste sympathy upon you again, Holmes. <laughs> it was necessary, Watson, just as it was for me to blame you for upsetting the table so that I could get to the dressing gown and find the paper there. Well, that's all very well, but confound it, I still don't know why the Cunninghams killed the coachman. Colonel, the old man cracked and told us the whole story when he saw how strong a case we had against him. It was pretty much as I had deduced. He and his son, Alec, had robbed the Acton House, looking for a legal document that would have helped in their lawsuit against Acton. When they failed to find it, they tried to make it appear like an ordinary robbery. Yeah, but where does William Kerwin... He witnessed the robbery, and he attempted blackmail. Ah. The Cunninghams think he slipped out and followed them the night of the robbery. But I think otherwise. You have some reason for that, Holmes. The note. Here's the whole text. If you will come around to the East Gate, you will be very much surprised and learn something of the greatest value to you and Annie Harrison. Say nothing to anyone. You think Annie was in on it? Well, let's say that it's entirely possible that she and William Kerwin were out walking the night of the robbery. And after seeing what went on, it's also possible that Annie may have suggested the whole plot to William. However, that's no longer important. And Watson and I want to thank you for the distinct success of our quiet rest in the country. All of us feel that we know Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson intimately. A tribute to the literary magic of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Yet Doyle left out so many questions in the private lives of his two immortals unanswered. For example, did you know that Watson married a second time? He did, according to a later Holmesian story, but no one knows her name. Simply because Dr. Watson never mentioned it. Well, perhaps therein lies the charm. I'll be back shortly. for the enduring popularity of the Sherlock Holmes tales may lie in the life of Conan Doyle himself. He was not only a writer, but also a doctor, athlete, dramatist, historian, war correspondent, and spiritualist. But most of all, he was always the helper of the underdog. And that may be his biggest asset. Our cast included Gordon Gould, William Griffiths, Ray Owens, and Lloyd Batista. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Tammy Grime, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.